live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? We are pretending you are living the reality of it. We are pretending here at KITM World Headquarters. And it is Friday, January 6th, 2017. I believe we got all the dates right there. I am, of course, uh, indisposed at the moment in real time. But I am recording for you, the loyal Kegro in the Morning listener, a Friday uh, installment in our show because... Why not? We missed Monday, of course, with it being the New Year's holiday. January, generally a tough month for us as the cold weather rolls in and all sorts of interruptions occur. So don't want to miss a opportunity to bring you at least four days of new shows this week. And of course, there's plenty, plenty, plenty of information and weird stories to bring you. Good stuff for a Friday. Today is, of course, the day, that is to say, the day... I'm pretending it is now, is the day on which the Electoral College's votes are opened in a joint session, just to be clear about what's happening, a joint session of the Congress held, of course, in the House chamber. You, I guess you could try to hold a a joint session in the Senate chamber. It's just where would everybody sit, right? The House chamber is the only one big enough to hold everybody. And so that's where the session is held. Uh, Super exciting. Those of you who have seen it, perhaps... Uh, perhaps live on C-SPAN, perhaps in Fahrenheit 9-11, the last time the uh, opening of the Electoral uh, the electoral College votes uh, made a big media splash. Although, uh, 2004, there was a slightly bigger splash in the actual, uh, inside the session than there was in 2000, interestingly enough. And so uh, that comes up. As part of the report I told you about yesterday, and that you have no doubt looked over since then, the alternate report written by, I didn't mention it, I didn't read much from it, I just discussed it in general, written by Stephen Rosenfeld, and it ran over at alternate, and of course, uh, many people picking up on that one. I've seen it in Recommended Diaries over at Daily Coast, I've seen it on Raw Story, we discussed it yesterday. Uh, You should not, as... Joan and I discussed on Wednesday, attach any particular uh, hopes to the outcome changing or even uh, of anything actually happening on, well, in today's session, Uh, likely because, of course, the outcome isn't, uh, well, isn't very likely to change, although it would be exciting. I, I, you know, for the sake of, uh, of, of sticking by the Constitution's strictures and, of course, any state laws that are implicated by this thing. I, you know, to me, I say go ahead. Raise the stink. It's okay, especially if you know the outcome isn't going to change. Don't panic, America, if if change or upheaval or surprises panic you. <laughs> the, the biggest surprise of all, of course, is that Donald Trump is president, but uh, okay. Other than that, uh, don't panic if uh, if a different outcome will send you off the cliff because you're not going to get one. But I thought it would be interesting at least to read a little bit of the the article itself. Uh, you already know what I think the likely outcome is and how, uh, how how legislators are likely to deal with the discrepancies. But I think they also make a good point in in the piece here uh, for, you know, maybe calling it into question. I'll I'll jump right in here. The headline that Steve Rosenfeld has put on his piece is at least 50 Trump electors were illegitimately seated as electoral college members. You'll recall the basic uh, structure of the argument, uh, and it's put this way. More than 50 electoral college members who voted for Donald Trump were ineligible to serve as presidential electors because they did not live in the congressional districts they represented. That was the other of the major objections. In addition to being dual office holders, that was a big problem. But 
in uh, well, many states, uh, I don't know whether all states do or not, but as you know, electoral college votes are allocated based on the number of seats you have in Congress, in total, not just the House of Representatives, but there are two that, I guess, represent the Senate's delegation to the uh, to Congress. It is a bit of a weird thing. I'm not really sure why they pinned it there. I guess they already had the... Uh, system set up, you know, having adopted the the compromise of the bicameral legislature, so that uh, one body would represent the, the 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 people directly and in some now whacked out proportion to their population, and that there would be one body that would represent states as states. We have warped it over time through various reforms, some better than others, uh, as Armando and I have discussed in the past. But uh, there you have it. So I guess they probably just said, well, look, the the system we've adopted for uh, representing people in Congress ought to have some carryover into the uh, Electoral College as well, so that there's at least some minimum number of electoral votes that every state has, although one would be a fine number two, um, but I guess then you find some difficult, I don't know, for some whatever reason they decided three would be the minimum number and they went forward from there. I, I don't know whether that makes any sense, and I don't know whether they, the states individually, I'm sure there's varying interpretations of it, did they say, did all of them say, this report alleges that many of them have said all right, since the electoral votes have been allocated on the basis of our representation in Congress, there will be one member of the Electoral College from each of the congressional districts, the House congressional districts, in our state. And then they've got two, do they elect them at large to represent the senators? I don't really know whether anybody bothered to, you know, to work it out to that level. But okay, so they did, you know, I would imagine that there's probably some states that don't care one way or the other that said uh, if we have, let's say, 12 electoral votes, the 12 people can be anybody. But apparently some states have uh, the requirement that the individual members of the Electoral College represent the various congressional districts in the state. And that makes it. I think that makes good sense. I mean, it, it, insofar as any congressional districts are representative of the regions of the state, then you want some, you know, you want geographical balance, I guess, for the very, okay, well, whatever. That's what they decided to do, so they did it. Now they should have to live up to it. That's the real point. Uh, So more than 50 Electoral College members apparently did not live in the congressional districts they represented, presumably in states where that matters, or they held elective office in states that bar dual office holders. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, you'll probably get some argument from people who will just stare you in the face and say, well, really, though, the Electoral College isn't a, a, an office. It is. It's just very short-lived. But <clears throat> that's uh, an argument uh, I expect people to make anyway, even though it doesn't make any particular sense. That stunning finding, uh, our, uh, Rosenfeld uh, continues, is among the conclusions of an extensive 1,000-plus page legal briefing I don't know how legal it is, but okay, it's styled legal briefing prepared by a bipartisan nationwide legal team for members of Congress who are being urged to object to certifying the 2016 Electoral College results on Friday. Uh, that's the upshot of the whole thing. The Congress has one more stab at it. They can, theoretically, vote not to accept some or all of the votes being presented in the joint session today. The mechanics of it are uh, not yet relevant, but we'll get to them later on. They are mentioned in the piece, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Trump's ascension to the presidency is completely illegitimate. That's probably true, but maybe not for this reason, but we'll see. Said Ryan Clayton of Americans Take Action, who is promoting the effort. It's not just Russians hacking our democracy. It's not just voter suppression at unprecedented levels. It is also that there are Republicans illegally casting ballots in the Electoral College and in a sufficient number that the results of the Electoral College proceedings are illegitimate as well. Uh, Technically, yes, I would say if all of this is true, there's a good point to all that. It 
again, just won't change things very much, not only because Donald Trump will be the choice of a Republican House anyway, but because I guess we tend to overlook these things for reasons of convenience and what the hell, it never matters anyway, and we're likely to do it again. Republicans, he continues, like to talk all the time about people voting illegally, Clayton continued, and this is a good point, too. We have a list of a bunch of Republicans that also allegedly voted illegally in the Electoral College. Pam Bondi is the Attorney General of the state of Florida, and the Florida Constitution says you cannot hold two offices. She holds the office of Attorney General and holds the office of Federal Elector in the Electoral College. That is a violation of the law says Clayton, that is a violation of the Constitution, and the vote that she cast in this election is illegal. It's a good place to start and not a bad conclusion. I don't know whether working the whole process out in courts somewhere would necessarily come to the same conclusion. Uh, There's wiggle room, I guess, on the office of the Electoral College, but it's hard to argue that it's not an office. It's just one that doesn't last very long. A joint congressional session is scheduled to ratify the 2016 Electoral College vote today, this Friday. While there have been calls to challenge that certification, including one woman-led effort, that's how it's described, saying Trump's victory is due to voter suppression targeting people of color, the analysis that scores of Trump electors were illegally seated and the additional finding that most states won by Trump improperly filed their Electoral College certificates of vote with the Congress is unprecedented. The research and the report uh, grew out of the legal activities surrounding the December 19th Electoral College meeting. Uh, Was it the 19th? Hmm. Oh, yes, that's right. It was. Uh, Okay, now I recall correctly. Uh, When Clayton and others urged Republican electors to reject Trump, saying they had a constitutional responsibility to pick a more qualified president. That effort, obviously, uh, never caught fire. You'll recall that one. Uh, We discussed it uh, at the time and a little bit yesterday, the faithless electors issue. Clayton is hoping that sufficient numbers of Republicans in Congress will not vote to ratify the Electoral College results, thus depriving Trump of the 270 Electoral College votes he needs to win the presidency. That, of course, would depend on, one, his analysis being correct, and two, Republicans agreeing to acknowledge that the analysis is correct and that we really owe it to ourselves to do this thing correctly, which they could still do and then yet vote to install Donald Trump. So it would be, you know, it won't happen, but it would be a, a fairly convenient way of Republicans demonstrating in some small way that they actually, you know, honor the Constitution that they say they are there to uphold. They're constantly harping about the Constitution so and strict interpretation of it. So we'll interpret it strictly and then have Donald Trump be our president. I don't see why they wouldn't do it, except that, I don't know, it's scary, and so they won't. That's really it. Anyway, uh, Clayton's hoping that sufficient numbers of Republicans will do that. They won't. But if that transpires, the House would then decide between the three top electoral vote-getters, Trump, Hillary Clinton, and Colin Powell. But before any of that can happen, there needs to be a formal challenge to ratifying the 2016 Electoral College results in Friday's joint session of Congress, which is where the research finding that scores of Trump votes were illegally cast comes in. By the way, I don't even remember who the top three Electoral College vote getters actually were, uh, but uh, it's, it's presented here as Clayton's assertion that Colin Powell is the third highest vote getter, and that rings true, but does does anybody know differently? All right. Anyway, it continues on. We have reason to believe that there are at least 50 electoral votes that were not regularly given, that's the language that's necessary, are not lawfully certified, 16 congressional district violations, and 34 dual officeholder violations, uh, it says parenthetically here. This is the executive summary being quoted from the electoral vote objection packet that they put together. The number could be over 100. I don't know, like, did they not finish their research or what? We urge you to prepare written objections for January 6th. I guess it might be difficult to uh, ascertain the the 
addresses of all of the members of the Electoral College. The information is just not out there, generally speaking, and you probably had to do a lot of research. But they found enough. The compiling of the laws and evidence uh, in this electoral vote objection package was completed by a national team of roughly 15 pro bono attorneys, law students, and legal assistants who represent no client or entity, the summary said. We are nonpartisan, Democrat, Republican, and independent. We live in different parts of the country, urban and rural, red states and blue states. Uh, people who know pickup truck owners and people who don't, I would gather, would be among their number. The Electoral College's results, the article continues, have only been challenged twice since 1877. The most recent was in 2005, following the 2004 election, of course, when an objection to Ohio's Electoral College votes, you remember this, was filed by Representative Stephanie Tubbs-Jones, Democrat of Ohio, and you'll recall from Fahrenheit 9-11, of course, the great shortcoming in the challenges that were being offered following the uh, debacle of the Florida vote count. No senator was willing to step forward. You had to have a member of the House and a member of the Senate agree jointly. Uh, I wonder whether it, the, it's specific to the rules or maybe only because it's a joint session. Eh, that's a good question. Anyway, uh, I, I think uh, I think the rules are that uh, at least one member of both bodies must be willing to put their name to an objection. And in 2004, I guess, after the great shame of not being able to find a uh, senator to step forward, though they were urged not to by the gracious and magnanimous Al Gore, perhaps a mistake, but he did ask them to do it and they honored it. But in 2004, Senator Barbara Boxer of California uh, agreed that, or I guess found herself uh, moved to uh, to join Representative Stephanie Tubbs-Jones in her objection. While that effort did not stop President George W. Bush's re-election, it did force both chambers of Congre Congress to debate for two hours before the Electoral College vote was ratified. Tubbs, Jones, and Boxer used the podium to rail against GOP efforts to suppress the vote and disqualify ballots in communities of color. Uh, you will recall, oh, it says right here in the next paragraph, the process for challenging the Electoral College is twofold. First, a House member has to file a formal formal challenge and objection, then one House member and one House, one Senator has to sign on, prompting each body to retire to their chambers for the two-hour debate. I don't know that a House member has to file the first formal challenge, but maybe that's actually the case. I don't know. The Electoral Vote Objection Packet Briefing cites two main areas where 2016 Electoral College members were illegally seated, and a third where their votes electing Trump were improperly sent to Congress. But before I continue on with that, I just want to point out uh, Stephanie Tubbs Jones and Barbara Boxer, I don't recall, uh, um, well, their effort was unsuccessful. And uh, I, I recall that, uh, say, in 2000, there was a great hesitancy outside, really outside of the Congressional Black Caucus. There were some members who spoke up from the House and said there was really a fairly serious issue here and we really ought to take a moment at least to pause and acknowledge it and debate it for a little while. But the, the, generally there was a great reluctance to attach your name to what seemed like a kind of wild and outlandish last minute, last ditch effort to try to change things. And that's likely to affect, that's like, it likely affected the 2004 effort. Although I would, I, I have to think that Fahrenheit 9-11 affected the 2004 effort a lot, too, just to get a senator to sign on. Uh, having failed to change anything, I think we might be back to square one, and it might be difficult to find people willing to put their names to the objections. Um, but I would, and, and they'll point back to maybe the 2004 and say, see, it doesn't do anything, so you just end up looking like a crackpot for nothing. I just wanted to point out, I don't believe Stephanie Tubbs-Jones or Barbara Boxer suffered any serious political cost in the long run to having done that it's just lost to history most people don't remember it it didn't affect them for more than a few days following and even that there was no measurable effect and so i would say to anybody who's actually considering uh making such an objection uh, unless you do change the outcome 
nobody's going to really seriously hold it against you long term. So maybe if you feel like it's something, an objection that needs to be noted for the record at a minimum, go ahead. Anyway, uh, where we left off was uh, the, uh, the, the various objections that this report made, both about people being illegally seated and uh, votes elector, uh, improperly sent to Congress. Let's see if we can get an explanation for that one. Specifically, it says at least 16 electors lived outside the congressional districts they represented in violation of state statutory residency requirements, and at least 34 electors held dual offices in direct violation of statutes prohibiting dual office holding. The briefing's uh, executive summary says, noting this violates two sections of the U.S. Constitution. Does it? Well, the first group of illegitimate electors amounts to political carpetbagging. In North Carolina, for instance, the briefing says, a state law, NCGS 163-1C, I'm taking their word for it, says, uh, states, one presidential elector shall be nominated from each congressional district. Yet we have voter registration cards showing that numerous North Carolina electors lived outside the congressional districts they represented. The report lists the following states and their number of illegitimate electors, um, topped off here by Arkansas that has two from outside congressional districts. Indiana has one. <clears throat> Louisiana's got one. Michigan's got one. North Carolina has seven. Oklahoma has one. And Texas has got three. Although, again, uh, I haven't looked at the details of this, and I, I don't know whether, again, state law may ha- provide for two at-large would it matter? I mean, if, you, if one of your out, at large people, uh, well, uh, then I, I don't know why you would assign them to a district. So uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what the methodology was. Uh, the second group of illegitimate electors, it says, is based on the fact that presidential electors hold federal office, however short lived, and that directly conflicts with states that ban elected officials from holding more than one office at a time. Florida's state constitution, for example, bars dual office holding. Its Supreme Court has issued rulings that further define what constitutes an office holder, and the state legislature has passed other laws treating them as public officials, such as reimbursing them for their travels. I guess we're talking about electors here. Ironically, Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi, who has issued a number of advisory legal opinions on dual office holding, was a presidential elector, the briefing said. Her name was on the governor's certification list of Republican electors, and also Attorney General Bondi cast her electoral ballot on December 19th. Joe Negron, who also cast an electoral vote, is currently president of the Florida Senate. The report lists the following states and their number of illegitimate electors based on dual office holders. Alabama with two, Florida with 12, Georgia four, Iowa two, Kansas 4, Kentucky 1, Michigan 1, Missouri 1, Nebraska 1, North Carolina 1, Ohio 1, Oklahoma 2, Pennsylvania 2, South Carolina with 1, South Dakota with 3, that's rather amazing, Uh, Tennessee with 2, Texas 4, only 4, Utah 1, and West Virginia 3. This tally, which adds up to 49 electors, was taken from a spreadsheet accompanying the briefing and is actually a larger number than what was cited in the report's executive summary, quoted above. Finally, there is another area of concern. Apparently 23 states out of the 31 that cast electoral votes for Trump did not properly report separate vote counts for president and vice president to Congress. That violates the 12th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and a federal law requiring presidential electors in each state to provide two distinct lists of votes. One for the president and the other for vice president. That's hard to believe that that would actually have happened. I wonder why it did. Of 31 states, only eight states followed that law, the report said. Some states codify the federal law in their own state law regarding presidential electors. Of those, 15 states did not provide two lists of signatures on their certificates of vote. We are not providing any legal advice, the briefing disclaimer says. We strongly suggest that members of Congress employ their own legal teams to verify our work. It may be that the efforts to convince Congress to challenge the ratification of the Electoral College amounts to a little more than a Hail Mary aimed at derailing the Trump presidency. 
As of late Wednesday, Clayton thought there would be House members willing to object to certifying the vote, but was less certain about finding a senator willing to go along. But even if a challenge is mounted and fails, it underscores the illegitimate basis of Trump's presidency and the deep opposition to it and refutes the GOP's outrageous claim that it has a mandate for dismantling government programs across the board. I don't know that it actually does that, of course, because I think, again, the outcome would likely be that Trump was elected to the presidency by the House and Pence to the vice presidency by the Senate. And there's all sorts of other reasons why we think the Trump presidency may be illegitimate, but I don't know that that would necessarily be one. But, but it, you know, it deserves to be mentioned. It really does. We have a list of 50 illegal electors, Clayton said. That puts Donald Trump below the thresholds he needs to be elected president. Let's debate it in an open session. According to the Constitution, the Congress, <clears throat> if nobody wins on the first round of balloting, picks from the top three candidates. And, of course, we know who those guys are. One of those guys not being a guy, in fact, Hillary Clinton, <clears throat> the, uh, the winner of the popular vote by nearly three million, as a matter of fact. Anyway. <clears throat> I thought it was important to uh, to get through the argument the way the article lays it out. We talked yesterday about why I don't think it would happen or go anywhere. But I also I, I, I wanted to bring it back up at least to say, look, you know, uh, history does not remember Stephanie Tubbs Jones or Barbara Boxer as those wild eyed radicals who undermined the American electoral system. They called it into question. The respective houses of Congress debated. They went back and did their thing, and they could do it again this time. There would be no serious interruption in all of it, but the Constitution's strictures would be honored, and I, I thought we were all for that. So, hey, why not? All right, so I also uh, wanted to bring you back some more information on good old Joey No Socks Chinque. I know we're spending too much time on him. He's a, he's a minor figure in all this. I just He's so fascinating, but it gives me an entree to talk to something, speak to something larger, and amazingly, Cinque comes up in it again, I think. Uh, so let me take this piece. Chicago Tribune, of all places, the Chicago Tribune decided to run this, although I guess, is it an AP piece? Is that what it was? Yeah, that's why. Um, I just thought it was interesting. I happened to stumble across it from the Chicago Tribune. I feel like we read something similar. Maybe we read this, maybe not, from a different outlet uh, running the AP piece. Uh, this was dated May 20th, 2016. And uh, under the headline, Trump acquaintance Joey No Socks, Helms firm that lavished awards on Trump businesses. You remember the basic story of Joey No Socks. But I just wanted to lay the foundation in case you're a latecomer to the show. Uh, you got the gist of it probably on Wednesday. Let me give you somebody who's organized their thoughts uh, on it instead. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, who is it? I don't know. It was an AP reporter. So anyway, uh, here's the story, though. More than a dozen Donald Trump golf courses, hotels, casinos, and private clubs have been honored with Star Diamond Awards. You remember that crap? <clears throat> From the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences, a company such as it is, it doles out shiny plaques representing, quote, the most prestigious award of true excellence in hospitality. Okay, so he's good at the puffery. The Trump Grill at Trump Tower has one, and you'll recall that we read a, a review of the Trump Grill, which really panned it and probably was uh, more accurate about what's going on than this is. But the Trump Grill, that terrible place, has got one of these. So does the Trump Buffet and Grill in the basement. Indeed, the entire New York City skyscraper sports one of the plaques for being, quote, the ultimate residential building worldwide. It sounds like Donald writes his own awards in a way, right? And maybe he does. But when it comes to Trump, the Academy isn't an independent observer. What? Shocking. You're kidding me. The organization is run by Joseph Cinque, a longtime Trump acquaintance who goes by the nickname Joey No Socks and has a felony conviction for possessing stolen property. Art, right? I, I just possessed it. I don't know. I fell out of the sky. Fell off a truck, right? By the way, if you're interested in looking anything up about Joe Cinque, it's C-I-N-Q-U-E, in case you were wondering. Uh, it's Italian for five. But he's a legitimate businessman, I'm saying. Anyway, as recently as last May, 
Trump himself was listed on the group's website as its, quote, ambassador extraordinaire. <laughs> they love the superlatives. No wonder they get along so well. And he appeared in a 2009 tribute video to Cinque in which he said, there's nobody like him. He's a special guy. I have the video put aside. It, it's rather ridiculous, but uh, I, I don't know if it's necessary to make the point. Anyway, Trump told the Associated Press on Friday that he doesn't know Cinque well and was unaware of Cinque's criminal conviction. Who knows whether that's the case, but I don't know. He got up on stage next to Trump as president-elect at the New Year's Eve party just the other day. Hmm, but whatever. If a guy is going to give you an award, you take it, Trump said. You don't tend to look up his whole life story. And that's probably true. But seriously. An AP review shows that about half the roughly 30 American Academy of Hospitality Sciences trustees listed in the company's own press materials appear to be Trump friends and business associates. At one point, Trump's two adult sons, the chief operating officer of the Trump Organization, Matthew Calamari, you know, his name has come up before on the show, and Trump's longtime butler, remember racist butler Anthony Senecal, all somehow served as, tr as trustees simultaneously. Trump's butler. Why? I don't know. Trump's kids? Okay. Right, whatever. It, actually, it'd probably not be on the realm of possibility that Trump established the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences and just put his friend at the helm of it. It may not be that Joe Chinque is the creative genius behind it. Whoever it is, I think it is. It, it is evil genius. Not terribly evil, but it's it, it's whatever. I don't know. I don't even want to put a, a label to it. You know, you've heard my feelings about it. At one point, oh, I just read this about the who's on the board. Uh, also listed are businessman... Howard Lorber, who has called Trump his hero, somehow, and actor Tony Lobianco, who said he believes he was introduced to Cinque years ago by Trump. I don't even know how I met the guy. I'm on the board of his thing. Okay. Trump said the board members connected to the Trump organization are likely just the recipient of honorifics. I don't know that anybody goes, he said. I've never gone to a board meeting. You're not on the board. Are your sons? Ask them. Okay. Uh, while the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences has given awards to hotels and restaurants around the globe, including famed Manhattan restaurants Le Cirque and Jean Georges, the company has also honored Mexican food, what? Poland's tourism board, and Sepp Blatter. Remember that guy? The former president of soccer's scandal-plagued governing body for, quote, Making the world's greatest sport even better. I mean, they give an award to like the most corrupt guy ever. And remember, remember when we read those weird uh, stories about the number of crazed weirdos from around the world who actually live in Trump buildings, Trump Tower in particular. And one of the guys that we read, even before Trump was running for office, we were reading about about FIFA corruption, uh, you know, a year or more ago. It had nothing to do with Trump. And we read about the corrupt guys, uh, in particular, one of the American members of the FIFA board. And, and we, uh, he was just an amazingly weird and corrupt guy. Like, how does he, how do you even get into this? And he lives in Trump Tower. I don't know whether Seth Blatter ever lived in Trump Tower, but uh, again, there's a bigger story, a more important one, I think goes a little deeper that again, you'll just be amazed by how many bells go off having heard all these stories already. Still, the article continues, the ties between Cinque and Trump appear to be close. Hmm, scratching my chin about that one. Cinque served as a judge with Donald Trump Jr. in the 2008 Miss Universe pageant. Why? They hardly know each other, right? The Academy honored Donald Trump with a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2013. My view is that this is primarily a marketing program, says Michael Patron, who heads up Triple A's ratings program, which gives out the five diamond status, right? There's the five stars. Who was that? Like the Michelin Guide? Triple uh, A is five diamonds. And again, this is so ridiculous. So what is, what is Chinque's? The, mine's better than both of them. It's a star diamond. And I go to six, right? 
this one goes to 11. Everybody, yeah, everybody remembers that joke. Uh, uh, oh, you know, and a Canadian, our Canadian pundit, Brian Monroe, made that joke just the other day in response to our first mention of Joey No Socks this week. Okay. Or maybe our second mention of Joey. I've been doing Joey No Socks all week. Okay. So Michael Patron, who heads up the, the one of the real ratings programs, AAA, Five Diamonds, says uh, uh, they give out their Five Diamond status to a fraction of the hotels that inspectors review annually, including... To some, Trump properties. A 1999 lawsuit against Chinkway by former business partner, a former business partner, alleges award winners paid promotional fees to be named in the group's glossy publications, calling the Academy merely the alter ego of Chinkway. A decade after that, ready? Trump friend Stuart Rahr, Yes, Stuart, you know, I should play this, uh, I should have said, Stuart Rar, and that's like record scratch of, oh, that's actually my uh, clip of Armando slamming on the brakes while calling in one day while he was driving. Dangerous, don't do it, I do not recommend it, but Stuart Rar, yes, that's Stuart Rar, Stewie Rara, number one king of all fun, the man who covered Donald Trump's obligation uh, for do- to donate a hundred thousand dollars to one of the veterans' charities that he allegedly raised money for, which launched the or relaunched the career of David Fahrenheit at the Washington Post. That Stuart Rar, a decade after being sued by his business partner Stuart Rar, also sued Chinque. I remember this we, from my, our original run through on all of these guys, uh, saying that they failed to publish a Man of the Year profile of his philanthropic efforts despite being paid a $25,000 fee. A judge ruled Rar was owed the $25,000. One former trustee, I guess, of the American Academy, William Hetzler, H-E-T-Z-L-E-R, founder of the German-American Hall of Fame, that explains something, said he cut ties after he wasn't reimbursed for expenses related to a trip to Germany in which he connected Cinque to high-end chefs. If someone's not trustworthy, I go in the other direction, says Hetzler, whose Hall of Fame inducted Trump during a 2012 ceremony in Trump Tower, because he's a very famous German-American, although he tells everybody that his heritage is Scottish, I believe. But uh, I think that was found out pretty quickly. Anyway, that's his mother's heritage was Scottish. Um, I, 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 I raise an eyebrow because of the, you know, the German-American Hall of Fame, et cetera, and a trip to Germany in which he connected Cinque to high-end chefs. I told you I have, maybe now I got to do it. I told you I had somewhere in here the video <clears throat> that, uh, of where Trump and uh, also Mark Burnett, the producer of The Apprentice, uh, 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 videotaped messages for Chinque, uh, because he was being honored at some event and they weren't able to attend. The reason they didn't or weren't able to attend, I, I imagine they could have made it there. They just don't care very much. But the, the event for the, again, for the head of the American Academy, American Academy of Hospitality Sciences was being held in Berlin. Did I mention this yesterday? I wonder if this was the trip where he also was being connected to high-end German chefs and then never did what? What was he supposed to do for Hetzler? Uh, he wasn't reimbursed for expenses to a, for, related to a trip to Germany. Which, again, I guess if the, fa- the founder of the German-American Hall of Fame, again, why do you have that? I don't know. But if that's, is that your full-time job or is that just a hobby? Uh, if you go to Germany and you're the head of the German-American Hall of Fame, I don't know that anybody needs to reimburse you for anything, but okay. They had an agreement, and Chinkway didn't reimburse them, and so they're mad at one another. The video I have here, let me grab this one up here, uh, is connected to a Who is Joseph Chinkwe piece, uh, or I guess it's just an entry in YouTube called Who is Joseph Chinkwe? Let me go to the original. I'll probably start auto-playing. I'll just let it Welcome roll. Welcome to the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences. To the Hotel Adlon, Berlin. Okay, that was the uh, what they used as an intro was a ridiculously liveried doorman at the what Hotel Aldon. Welcome to the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences. 
to the Hotel Adlon, Berlin. Joe in Berlin. Okay. So now inside, we're now taken. It's a terrible edit, but we're just taken to the event. The, the audio is also awful. I don't know if you, I don't know what you can and can't hear with that, but uh, we'll let it roll. And inside, the event is underway. Joe Cinque is there in a tux, uh, and he's up on stage. There's a big backdrop uh, of the uh, interesting the, of the American Academy of uh, Hospitality Sciences. And by the way, the uh, one, yeah. Uh, also on the background is the five star diamond awards. M- mind you, again, he gives Trump properties six. But the official event here is to uh, honor him for his I don't know what his service in giving out the five star diamond awards. Uh, so he's up there on stage, and I guess he's being introduced and being given his award. And then they play the promotional videos from Trump and Burnett. I'll try and let it roll, but I'm sure I'll interrupt it again. It's, uh, most of all, to all of us, a friend. We love the way he goes about business with us. He is a creative genius. He's got us all to believe in what we're doing here. We all believe in what he's doing. And we will not miss, and we will not want to miss, to be here every year for this award. i got to pause it again. I don't know, that person is not being identified in the video, that German-accented gentleman. I wonder if that's William Hessler, or whatever his name is. Anyway, uh, as you might have been able to hear from that muddy audio, they love him. He is a creative genius. We love doing the way he does business with us. Something, something, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's move on. Then Johnny and all the other hoteliers pose for pictures with Joe and the beautiful representatives of the Academy. The beautiful representatives of the Academy are, of course, Miss Universe and Miss Teen USA contestants. I see their sashes here. I imagine this is Miss USA. So Trump sends his pageant contestants to decorate these awards as well. Interesting. When the world is cold. To Frank music. Then Bill Boggs introduced a video message from Donald Trump, who was busy working on his hit TV series, The Apprentice. It's a great honor for me to welcome you to the Star Diamond Award in Berlin. I wish I could have been there, but a thing called The Apprentice kept me away, my little television show that I'm very happy to report just got rated number one on television. So. I'm quite happy today, but I'm unhappy that I can't be with you. I'd especially like to congratulate and thank Joe Chinkwe, the head of the Academy, for the unbelievable job that he does. There's- now, uh, again, I, I want to stop just to point out, first of all, <clears throat> Trump has assumed his usual favorite position for a stand-up interview or photo or video in his Trump Tower office. That is the one uh, uh, in front of the wall of his framed <clears throat> pictures of himself and uh, magazine covers, including the one he loves to stand next to, the Playboy magazine cover. Uh, remember, uh, this is he doesn't know Joe Cinque. He doesn't know who he is. He's doing this honorific thing, for, uh, you know, honorary uh, video for him. It's cut into the video here is another shot of Trump and Cinque sitting side by side, and I guess he's got what may be our Cinque's grandkids on their laps, bouncing around. I don't know who these little girls are, but uh, as you know, he he doesn't have any idea who Joe Cinque is. I hardly know the guy. Nobody like him. He's a special guy. There's just nobody close. Enjoy the evening. You can have a great time. And again, congratulations to the Academy. Mark Burnett, the powerful and innovative executive producer not only of The Apprentice, but also the Survivor series, sent a message to Joe as well. Joey Chinque, your friend Mark Burnett here, Survivor, The Apprentice. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in Berlin. My schedule time right now is crazy. And your buddy Donald Trump has got me working like crazy. Trump, the man. And uh, I know we're going to be airing the show, you know, in Germany very, very soon. So Trump's going to become a legend also in Germany. Listen, I know your conference will be successful. Maybe include me next year. I'd love you to include me next year. I'm sorry I couldn't make it this year. So Joey Cinque, my buddy, I got your back. Have a great conference. Actor George Hamilton was on hand, and he talked about excellence in the service industry and American Academy President Joe Cinque. I knew Joey Cinque. I know the award very well. And it's, it's a unique thing. When I was a young man um, starting in, in film business, 
I realized that there were a few people who had it right. Cary Grant, Fred Astaire, and Clark Gable. And I thought to myself, I'd like to be part of that. And at MGM, where I went under contract, they said, we can make you into anything you want. I thought, what do they mean by that? First day I went down, they showed me all the wardrobe of all the top stars. And they said, pick out what you'd like to be. And I thought, and I saw Cary Grant's suit. I thought, that's what I'd like to be. And then I realized the reason for greatness is not big things, it's little things. And I talked to Cary Grant about a week or two later, and he said, you only want a suit that's a frame around a picture. You don't want something that you look at. And I thought, it's about details. It's about being the best at something. is sometimes very subtle. And when I heard about the award they gave tonight, I watched a lot of people on why they were successful, why they got the award, and I thought, okay, I'll be happy to give an award like that if it's sincere and it's important and it means something, I'll do it. Oh, well. What do you think about this guy, Joe Chinkway? I mean, I, I personally think he's an amazing guy. I've known him about a year and a half. He seems to be a driven guy to be able to do something like this. We've done a lot of work in China, Indonesia. He seems to be doing a lot to really help the world. What, what, what do you think about this guy? I, I, what? I don't know who's narrating this, but by the way, obviously, I think they're obviously big Joe Chinque fans. What do you think about this guy? I've known him about a year and a half. I think he's amazing. I think he's driven. I think he's making the. He's doing a lot of things to improve the world. He's making the world a better place, improving the world. He's doing no such thing. No such thing. Joey, Joey is a catalyst for everything. You know, he's a guy, if you look in his eyes, he's got a sparkle in his eyes all the time because he's really enthused about this. And he's young all the time in, in, in his, his enthusiasm. It's hard to, to organize all of this, to put it together. Joey's a guy who just is like a magnet for all these people. And they come to him because they know he knows all the right people and he puts it together. So from now on, Joey's my friend. Joe's been a great inspiration to me. He's done an amazing job. With his- uh, speaking right now is Donald Trump Jr., who uh, looks every bit as ridiculous as he always did, but much younger. So now he is paying tribute to Joe Chinque. Of course, he hardly knows him either, even though he's on the board of his uh, organization. But okay, uh, muddy audio again, but let's roll it. You know, the American Academy, and I've really seen in the hotel industry how they've been able to prosper and really become the premier rating agency in the world. He's just done a great job, and I want to congratulate him on his success. And Joe Chinque is the uh, catalyst to all of this and the... The catalyst to all this, again, coming out again. This is Tony Lobianco, who was mentioned earlier, who's now speaking. By the way, I just, uh, commenting on Donald Jr.'s comments that, that, that the Star Diamond Award has now become the premier ratings award in the industry. Obviously ridiculous, but okay, just typical Trump puffery. Great inspiration and one of the best, best people anybody can know. The way you look tonight. And that's the end of this garbage piece of video. I don't know where this came from or uh, whether it's a, a, a piece that was offered up in support of Joe Cinque or a, as an attack on Joe Cinque. I couldn't tell you based on that. It was an awful video, by the way. But just I thought that was interesting just in terms of uh, the kind of puffery that goes on. And these guys who are all loosely loosely connected in ways, but when it comes to video that Joe Cinque is going to see... Uh, oh, yeah, he's a great guy. He's changing the world. He's a fantastic. He's the savior of the universe, basically. Uh, when it comes to other people's questions about it, like that might have some maybe law enforcement implications. I, I, I never heard of him. Anyway, uh, no indication that William Hetzler was the guy uh, in that video or had anything to do with the the fact that this award for this American Academy was happening in Berlin. I still don't have an answer for that one. But OK, uh, my my surmise is that, yeah, uh, it coincided with this trip. All right. Anyway, Hetzler said Chinque sometimes gives awards for free and sometimes charges for the honor. Trump told the AP that he's familiar with groups that try to sell awards as a marketing gimmick. Uh, yeah, I am too. Uh, Newt Gingrich, as a matter of fact, loves to do that, uh, sells awards as marketing gimmicks. But he said he has never paid Chinque's organization for its distinctions. Whoever received, and uh, I'll, I'll continue with this in a second, um, he's never paid for it and, and likely uh, never paid cash for it, certainly. I wouldn't doubt that they comp Chinque all the time, maybe just because he's a friend and also then they get these awards and everything, but that might all be sort of understood as part of it. I think that there's a lot of businesses that probably comp him for the awards. It may be, I mean, genuinely, Joe Chinque probably genuinely loves Donald Trump 
and has a great time staying at all of his places and is comp, then it would be hard to decide which came first, the chicken or the egg. Uh, and so he genuinely believes that these are great places because they treat him fabulously there and he knows no better. Anyway, uh, I thought this was interesting too. Here is a bit, I didn't want to jump right into it, but now it's time to return to it. Um, Trump says he's never paid. Some people, Hetzler says, do pay. Some don't. Uh, In the case of Stewie Rara, they pay and then they don't get what they pay for and they sue. But this is interesting. So the reporters, I guess, call the organization and say, how do you get one of these awards? Do you pay for it? Do you not pay for it? What's the deal? And here's the answer they got. Whoever received an award, uh, uh, whoever received a reward uh, with an R, reward, not a word, but I think they mean a word. Whoever received a reward qualified, said the woman who answered the phone at Chinkway's company, who refused to give her name because it's a totally legitimate company, right? Uh, hey, whoever got a reward deserved it. It's an A ward. What's your name? Uh, I'm not telling you. That's not the end of the comment, though. Whoever received a reward qualified, said the woman who answered the phone at Chinkway's company, who refused to give her name. Why don't you go after Hillary Clinton? <laughs> what kind of follow-up is that? All of a sudden, now it's a political organization. Interesting response. I mean, very telling, I think, for whoever the hell it was that answered that phone. Uh, and, and now I wonder, I mean, I, where is the award or the uh, hospitality sciences headquarters? Because I understood that Cinque had offices in Trump Tower. It may very well be that that's where they were calling. And wouldn't it be interesting if... Uh, Cinque staffed his place with Trump loyalists because they work in Trump Tower, and that's why they went immediately, oh, yeah, well, why don't you something, something, Hillary Clinton? What reason in the world would there be for the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences to deflect to Hillary Clinton? None. None. A lawyer for the company, Stuart Perry, said Cinque wouldn't comment but called the company a pretty open book. The basic overall of the Academy, per se, is dealing with five- and six-star properties, Perry said. Perry is also a trustee advisor to the Academy, and as as is a lawyer who represents Cinque in his failed attempts to appeal the 2008 drunk driving conviction in New Jersey. I'll tell you what, I can't pay you for representing me, but I can put you on the board of the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences. Sometimes you'll be able to maybe, if you're lucky, judge a beauty pageant. And I'll arrange for you to meet the girls, and you'll get comped at a great suite. Why don't you do that? Uh, Good arrangement. According to a 1995 profile in New York Magazine, Chinque pleaded guilty to a felony after police broke down the door of his Manhattan apartment. Where is that apartment? and found a trove of valuable stolen art, including prints by Marc Chagall. Court records show he pleaded guilty to possession of stolen property in 1989. Again, that filed by the Associated Press. Joe Chinque, is he a big deal? Is he not a big deal? I don't know. But his name keeps coming up, and it's a little bit weird. Where's the next item up for bids, as they say on uh, uh, The Price is Right? Every time I say the next item, I I think I always come up with that one. All right, yeah, here we go. This one is a weird article, and it's a long read, and it probably occupies the rest of the show. And as a matter of fact, I probably ought to keep an eye on the time for this. But uh, this one comes, I picked this one up right alongside David K. Johnston's tweet of Chinkway's photo with Trump on New Year's Eve. And I don't know whether... I think it was somebody else distributing it, and I'm pretty sure I can put my finger on it if I just take a pause. But David K. Johnston makes an appearance in the header of this piece, re- uh, recommending the strong work of the author of the piece, with whom I'm not familiar. And it's pretty extraordinary stuff, so now I'm curious. But James S. Henry is the author of the piece. It runs in the American Interest, which... I also am not familiar with, but David K. Johnston, I certainly am. And I'll tell you what he has to say uh, before beginning the reading of this piece. Okay, so by way of introduction, I mentioned that I have this piece from the American Interest. And I did dig up the tweet which brought it to my attention. It was, uh, unsurprisingly, Kate Sherrill who sent me this, uh, wow, I guess uh, just before the new year. 
uh, December 31st timestamp on this one. A long read, she says, but very important. And I did read it. I just haven't brought it uh, to the air until now. And she is retweeting John Dean of Watergate fame, <clears throat> who uh, attaches this article along with this comment. Why is Trump so pro-Putin? The answer is money, of course. Uh, here's as good an overview as possible without his taxes, which, of course, we haven't seen and are likely never to see. But uh, what's he talking about? He's talking about this piece in The American Interest. And again, up at the top of the piece here, there's some uh, introductory material, sort of uh, almost like dust jacket cover stuff from uh, <clears throat> from uh, James Henry's, uh, or, or, or I guess from David K. Johnston, uh, and then some other material here. It's included, I don't know, really, this doesn't really fit at the beginning of an article, usually under normal circumstances, but here it is. Uh, the Curious World of Donald Trump's Private Russian Connections is the name of the piece, subtitled, Did the American People Really Know They Were Putting Such a Well-Connected Guy in the White House? <clears throat> and then the introductory material begins thus. Throughout Donald Trump's presidential campaign, he expressed glowing admiration for Russian leader Vladimir Putin, Many of Trump's adoring comments were utterly gratuitous. After his Electoral College victory, Trump continued praising the former head of the KGB while dismissing the findings of all 17 American national security agencies that Putin directed Russian government interference to help Trump in the 2016 American presidential election. <clears throat> As veteran investigative economist and journalist Jim Henry shows below, a robust public record helps explain the fealty of Trump and his family to this murderous autocrat and the network of Russian oligarchs. Putin and his billionaire friends have plundered the wealth of their own people. They have also run numerous schemes to defraud governments and investors in the United States and Europe. <clears throat> From public records, using his own renowned analytical skills, Henry shows what the mainstream news media in the United States have failed to report in any meaningful way, for three decades, Donald Trump has profited from his connections to the Russian oligarchs, whose own fortunes depend on their continued fealty to Putin. We don't know the full relationship between Donald Trump, the Trump family, and their enterprises with the network of world-class criminals known as the Russian oligarchs. Henry acknowledges that his, this article, his article, <clears throat> poses more questions than answers, and we got to keep that in mind, establishes more connections than full explanations. But what Henry does show should prompt every American to rise up in defense of their country to demand a thorough, out-in-the-open congressional investigation with no holds barred. <clears throat> well, it's a nice demand, but that's all it will remain, I'm sure. The national security of the United States of America and of peace around the world, especially in Europe, may well depend on how thoroughly we understand the rich network of relationships between the 45th president, and the Russian oligarchy. When Donald Trump chooses to exercise, or not exercise, his power to restrain Putin's drive to invade independent countries and seize their wealth, as well as loot countries beyond his control, Americans need to know in whose interest the president is acting or looking the other way. Those are the comments of David K. Johnston, a <clears throat> Pulitzer Prize winning author, it is noted here, and the author of The Making of Donald Trump. The piece then, uh, before starting up, jumps to a quote from Cervantes. Tell me who you walk with, and I'll tell you who you are. And one more setup piece. <clears throat> this time a quote from Donald Trump's book, Surviving at the Top, as though he knew anything about that. I've always been blessed with the kind of intuition about people that allows me to sense who the sleazy guys are, and I stay far away. Yeah, whatever. Okay, and now the body of the piece. Even before the November 8th election, many leading Democrats were vociferously demanding that the FBI disclose the fruits of its investigations into Putin-backed Russian hackers. Instead, FBI Director Comey decided to temporarily revive his zombie-like investigation of Hillary's emails. That decision may well have had an important impact on the election, but it did nothing to resolve the allegations about Putin. Even now, after the CIA has disclosed an abstract of its own still-secret investigation, it is fair to say that we still lack the cyberspace equivalent of a smoking gun. 
Fortunately, however, for those of us who are curious about Trump's Russian connections, there is another readily accessible body of material that has so far received surprisingly little attention. This suggests that whatever the nature of the president-elect Donald Trump's relationship with President Putin, whatever the nature of it, he has certainly managed to accumulate direct and indirect connections with a far-flung private Russian-slash-FSU network of outright mobsters, oligarchs, fraudsters, and kleptocrats. No holds barred here, I guess. Any one of these connections might have occurred at random, but the overall pattern is a veritable Star Wars bar scene of unsavory characters. I've referred to Moss Osley before in my own uh, review of this stuff, with Donald Trump seated right in the middle. The analytical challenge is to map this network, a task that most journalists and law enforcement agencies focused on individual cases have failed to do. <clears throat> of course, to label this network private may be a stretch, given that in Putin's Russia, even the toughest mobster learn the hard, lear, mobsters learn the hard way to maintain a respectful relationship with the new Tsar. But here, the central question pertains to our new Tsar. Did the American people really know they were putting such a well-connected guy in the White House? The big picture, it says, kleptocracy and capital flight. A few of Donald Trump's connections to oligarchs and assorted thugs have already received sporadic press attention. For example, former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort's reported relationship with exiled Ukrainian oligarch Dmitryo Firtash. And there's plenty of foreign names in this piece for me to mangle. But no one has pulled the connections together, used them to identify still more relationships, and developed an image of the overall patterns. It's kind of what the FBI is supposed to do. Maybe they're doing it. We just don't know. They're not certainly not discussing that so far. Nor has anyone related these cases to one of the most central facts about modern Russia, its emergence since the 1990s as a world-class kleptocracy, second only to China as a source of illicit capital and criminal loot, with more than $1.3 trillion of net offshore flight wealth as of 2016. That's what it says here. I, I might have uh, reversed the, the words there and called it wealth flight, but uh, they, they do it intentionally here. So maybe I don't quite grasp why they chose flight wealth <clears throat> as opposed to wealth flight. Wealth flight, I guess, is what's happening, and the wealth that you take would be flight wealth, I guess. Anyway... Uh, this tidal wave of illicit capital is hardly just Putin's doing. It is, in fact, a symptom of one of the most epic failures in modern political economy, one for which the West bears a great deal of responsibility. This is the failure in the wake of the Soviet Union's collapse in the late 1980s to ensure that Russia acquires the kind of strong middle-class-centric economic and political base that is required for democratic capitalism, the rule of law, and stable, peaceful relationships with its neighbors. Instead, from 1992 to the Russian debt crisis of August 1998, <clears throat> the West in general and the U.S. Treasury, USAID, the State Department, the IMF and World Bank, the EBRD, and many leading economists in particular actively promoted and indeed helped to finance one of the most massive transfers of public wealth into private hands that the world has ever seen. For example, Russia's 1992 voucher privatization programs permitted a tiny elite of former state-owned company managers and party apparatchiks to acquire control over a vast number of public enterprises, often with the help of outright mobsters. For instance, uh, here's one example here. The, a majority of Gazprom, the state energy company that controlled a third of the world's gas reserves, was sold for $230 million. That seems like an awfully low price. Russia's entire national electric grid was privatized for $630 million. Zil, Z-I-L, Russia's largest auto company, went for about $4 million. Ports, ships, oil, iron and steel, aluminum, much of the high-tech arms and airlines industries, the world's largest diamond mines, and most of Russia's banking system also went for a song. You know, the Soviet Union collapsed. All of these were public properties. They needed to privatize. They didn't need to, but they decided to privatize. And the only way they could think of to do it was, well, I don't know, whoever's got money that they can give to us, we're cash-strapped, give us 
money and we'll give you one of these industries. We don't know what else to do with it. Somebody's got to buy it. Might as well be you. It really was rather, rather, rather amazing. And I'm sure at the time, Western economists were like, well, I don't know. That's the wrong way to go about it. But to hell with it. It's Russia. Who cares? It's not here. Uh, they, and, and then they'll all own something. And ownership is a great idea anyway. And uh, maybe it'll just transform them into capitalists out of nowhere with no further training. But <clears throat> no, that was not to be. And they probably anticipated it. Again, said, it's not like it's a Western country we're dividing up here. It's Russia. Russia will go back, to, go from being a, a hell to uh, being a different kind of hell. Who cares? Of course, I guess they didn't anticipate. What would happen after 20, 30 years of this kind of profiteering and looting? They would have a pile of cash and nothing left in Russia to buy. Where would they turn? They would probably end up buying American assets and Western assets and turning the uh, America and the rest of the West into the same kind of hyper-capitalist kleptocratic hell. Well, here we are. In 1994 to 96, the under the infamous Loans for Shares program, Russia privatized 150 state-owned companies for just $12 billion, most of which was loaned to a handful of well-connected buyers by the state and indirectly by the World Bank and the IMF. In case you were wondering, uh, now how, do you, how does a collapsing communist society where nobody's got a massive accumulation of wealth, uh, it's one thing to say, all right, let's privatize it and maybe we'll sell the business off to the people who formerly managed it for the Soviet government. Fine, in theory. Where do they get the cash? Nobody's got that kind of cash. Well... Occasionally, the state simply said, here, have the cash, <clears throat> and we'll just call the thing private, or the IMF and World Bank financed these purchases. And that's not, I guess, all. But I guess some, uh, also, I guess a mobster, even in a communist nation, can uh, accumulate a large pile of cash. But anyway, uh, moving on with the facts here, or at least as presented here in, in the article, the principal beneficiaries of this privatization, which they include, enclose in scare quotes, actually cartelization, were initially just 25 or so budding oligarchs with the insider connections to buy these properties and muscle to hold them. The happy few who made personal fortunes from this feeding frenzy, in a sense the very first of the new kleptocrats, not only included numerous Russian officials, but also leading gringo investors and advisors, Harvard professors, USAID advisors, and bankers at Credit Suisse First Boston and other Wall, uh, Wall, Wall Street investment banks. I, you know, once this happened, <clears throat> if you were brave enough to just jump on a uh, on a jet and fly to Moscow, you would be in a position with a suitcase full of cash to buy an entire state-owned industry pretty simply, pretty easily. And they'd be happy to sell it to you. As the renowned development economist Alex uh, Gersh... Gershenkron, guessing at that pronunciation, an authority on Russian development once said, if I were in Vienna, we would have said, we wish we could play it on the piano. Now, I read that over the weekend and I said, when I read this on the air, I'm going to have no idea what the hell that means. I wonder if there's a place I could have looked it up in the meantime. I forgot about it, but now I remember. If, what does that mean? If we were in Vienna, we would have said, we wish we could play it on the piano. And it's with an exclamation point. So he thinks he's being super clever. And maybe he is. And I'm being dense. Does anybody know what that means? Of course, we're recording this, so I won't find out until probably, uh, well, Friday afternoon or maybe Monday. All right. I wish, we could, I wish I could play it on the piano and understand why I was playing the piano. For the vast majority of ordinary Russian citizens, this extreme reconcentration of wealth coincided with nothing less than a full-scale 1930s-type depression, a shock therapy-induced rise in domestic price levels that wiped out the private savings of millions. Rampant lawlessness, a public health crisis, and a sharp decline in life expectancy and birth rates. Also accompanying this, I guess. Sadly, this neoliberal market reform, quote-unquote market reform policy package, was uh, <clears throat> that was introduced at a Stalin-like pace from 1992 to late 1998, was not only condoned, but partly designed and financed by senior Clinton administration officials, neoliberal economists, and innumerable USAID, World Bank, and IMF officials. The few dissenting voices included some of the West's best economic brains, Nobel laureates like James Tobin, Kenneth Arrow, Lawrence Klein, and Joseph Stiglitz. 
They also included Moscow University's Sergei Glaziev, who now serves as President Putin's chief economic advisor. Unfortunately, they were no match for the folks with the cash. There was also an important intervention in Russian politics. In January 1996, a secret team of professional U.S. political consultants, hooray, arrived in Moscow to discover that, as CNN put it back then, the only thing voters like less than Boris Yeltsin is the prospect of upheaval. The expert's solution was one of the earliest Our Brand is Crisis campaign strategies in which Yeltsin was spun as the only alternative to chaos. To support him in March 1996, the IMF also pitched in with $10.1 billion of new loans on top of $17.3 billion of IMF World Bank loans that had already been made. I am reminded here of another piece I put aside that we won't get to today. may even not uh, read it in full, I'm sure, ever on the air. It was an enormously depressing thing, but uh, uh, purporting to sort of be... uh, the um, hmm, the revelation that we were all here in the United States missing about the reality of Putin and his long-term plans. It ran in Politico, and I, it was the kind of, you know, it was really interesting material, and I, I just, what, I, I couldn't distill out of it. What are you trying to say? I mean, other than depress the hell out of us, uh, Russia's a hellhole, and they're looking to turn everybody else into a hellhole too, but how exactly? By, by what means it would, would this happen? And I wasn't able to really distill anything concrete out of it, but I did notice it was very interesting in that it was all written by somebody. I don't know whether it was somebody who was there in this day, you know, was was one of the banks of U.S. political consultants that arrived in Moscow, but the, just a shady bunch of people that actually went and did that. Anyway, it was an American-sounding name, and uh, the whole premise of the, you know, why we should be listening to them was that she had been spending all this time uh, as a consultant in Russia and along around the Russian frontier and was very well familiar, very well familiarized with the <clears throat> the thinking going on in the Putin government and uh, in the neighboring uh, countries and just the whole East Bloc dissolution thing. And I don't know, it's it's just weird the people who threw themselves into Eastern Europe at that time, uh, an odd bunch, and I I don't know whether I trust them uh, at all. Anyway, back to this article. With all this outside help, plus ample contributions from Russia's new elite, Boris Yeltsin went from just 8% approval in the January 1996 polls to a 54-41% victory over the Communist Party candidate, Gennady Z- oh boy, uh, Zuyaganov. My best uh, crack at that. I don't recall the name's pronunciation from the time. In the second round of the July 1996 election, at the time, mainstream media like Time and the New York Times were delighted. Very few outside Russia questioned the wisdom of this blatant intervention in post-Soviet Russia's first democratic election, or the West's right to do it in order to protect itself. An interesting position. By the late 1990s, the actual chaos that resulted from Yeltsin's warped policies had laid the foundations for a strong counter-revolution, including the rise of ex-KGB officer Putin and a massive outpouring of oligarchic flight capital that has continued, continued virtually up to the present. For ordinary Russians, as noted, this was disastrous. But for many banks, private bankers, hedge funds, law firms, and accounting firms, for leading oil companies like ExxonMobil, like maybe the uh, new uh, Secretary of State, ExxonMobil, and BP, as well as for needy borrowers like the Trump Organization. The opportunity to feed on post-Soviet spoils was a godsend. This was vulture capitalism at its worst. Not how I necessarily would have ended the paragraph, but yeah, the point worth distilling out of this. So as the chaos looms, the people who had looted post-Soviet Russia move their capital out of the country. They needed to park it somewhere. And that, like they said, is a godsend for private bankers, hedge funds, law firms, accounting firms, et cetera, et cetera, business partners, and needy borrowers like the Trump Organization. In the late 1990s, no one was lending money to the Trump Organization. It was a disaster. Their biggest ventures had gone under in spectacular fashion, and he was pretty much finished. But 
ready to launch the new TV show. And, you know, it was surviving on, I guess, these partnership deals and then later the licensing deals. But uh, they needed people <clears throat> who were basically looking at losing all of their looted capital anyway. So for them, the idea of investing it overseas is a great idea. And not everybody would touch that crap, but Trump would. And guess what? It worked out. The nine lived Trump in particular had just suffered a string of six successive bankruptcies. So the massive illicit outflows from Russia and oil rich FSU members like Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan from the mid 1990s provided precisely the kind of undiscriminating investors that he needed. These outflows arrived at just the right time to fund several of Trump's post 2000 high risk real estate and casino ventures most of which failed. As Donald Trump Jr., Executive Vice President of Development and Acquisitions for the Trump Organization, told the Bridging U.S. and Emerging Markets Real Estate Conference in Manhattan in September 2008, on the basis, he said, of his own half-dozen trips to Russia in 18 months, in terms of high-end product influx into the United States. Product influx? You mean dollars? Russians make up a pretty disproportionate cross-section of a lot of our assets, say in Dubai, and certainly with our project in Soho, and anywhere in New York. We see a lot of money pouring in from Russia. That's been cited many times, of course, during the campaign, alongside denials of any involvement in business in Russia whatsoever, when necessary. All this helps explain one of the most intriguing puzzles about Donald Trump's long, turbulent business career, how he managed to keep financing it, despite a dismal track record of failed projects. According to the official story, this was simply due to a combination of brilliant deal-making, Trump's gold-plated brand, and raw animal spirits, with $916 million of creative tax dodging as a kicker. But this official story is hokum. The truth is that since the late 1990s, Trump was also greatly assisted by these abundant new sources of global finance, especially from submerging markets like Russia. This suggests that neither Trump nor Putin is an uncaused cause. They are not evil twins exactly, but they are both byproducts of the same neoliberal policy scams that were peddled to Russia's struggling new democracy. Next section, a guided tour of Trump's Russian slash FSU connections at last. Okay. The following roundup of Trump's Russo Soviet business connections is based on published sources, interviews with former law enforcement staff and other experts in the United States, the United Kingdom and Iceland, hmm, searches of online corporate registries and a detailed analysis of offshore company data from the Panama Papers. Just to tie that in. Given the sheer scope of Trump's activities, there are undoubtedly other worthy cases, but our interest is in overall patterns. Note that none of the activities and business connections related here necessarily involved criminal conduct. While several key players do have criminal records, few of their prolific business dealings have been thoroughly investigated, and of course, they all deserve the presumption of innocence. Might be a mistake, but we do that here. Furthermore, Several of the players reside in countries where activities like bribery, tax dodging, and other financial chicanery are either not illegal or are rarely prosecuted. As former British Chancellor of the Exchequer Dennis Healy once said, the difference between legal and illegal is often just the width of a prison wall. So, why spend time collecting and reviewing material that either doesn't point to anything illegal or in some cases may even be impossible to verify? Because, we submit, the mere fact that such assertions are widely made is of legitimate public interest in its own right. In other words, when it comes to evaluating the probity of senior public officials, and there's no more senior, of course, than the President of the United States, the public has the right to know about any material allegations, true, false, or most commonly unprovable, about their business partners and associates, so long as this information is clearly labeled as unverified. And so, keep that in mind. It's clearly labeled, we'll say, as unverified. Furthermore, the individual case-based approach to investigations employed by most investigative journalists 
and law enforcement often misses the big picture. The global networks of influence and finance, licit and illicit, I, I never use licit as a word, but okay, that exist among business people, investors, kleptocrats, organized criminals, and politicians, as well as the enablers like banks, accounting firms, law firms, and havens, any particular component of these networks might easily disappear without making any difference. But the network lives on. It is these shadowy transnational networks that really deserve scrutiny. And for guys who are uh, rallying the alt-right and white working class voters as anti-globalists, I guess uh, this becomes uh, that much more difficult to understand. Okay, case number one will begin ringing some bells for you guys who've been listening for a while. The Bayrock Group, LLC, Kazakhstan, and Tevfik Arif. Does it ring bells? Here we go. We'll begin our tour of Trump's Russian slash FSU connections with several business relationships that evolved out of the curious case of Bayrock Group, LLC, a spectacularly unsuccessful New York real estate development company that surfaced in the early 2000s and by 2014 had all but disappeared except for a few lawsuits. As of 2007, Bayrock and its partners reportedly had more than $2 billion of Trump-branded deals in the works. But most of these either never materialized or were miserable failures for reasons that will soon become obvious. Bayrock's white elephants included the 46-story Trump Soho condo hotel on Spring Street in New York City, for which the principal developer was a partnership formed by Bayrock and FL Group, an Icelandic investment company. Completed in 2010, the Soho soon became the subject of prolonged civil litigation by disgruntled condo buyers. We, of course, have mentioned it in the past because it was one of the few condo developments that I can ever recall having a launch party with uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, beauty pageant contestants in attendance. Who has a launch party for a condo building? Well, the Trumps do. All right. Uh, oh, and if they're in partnership with uh, Russian mobsters, they might enjoy it too. Okay. So, completed in 2010, uh, soon became a subject of prolonged litigation by disgruntled condo buyers. The building was foreclosed by creditors and resold in 2014. We didn't hear much about that. After more than $3 million of customer down payments had to be refunded. Similarly, Bayrock's Trump International Hotel and Tower in Fort Lauderdale was foreclosed and resold in 2012, while at least three other Trump-branded properties in the United States, plus many other project concepts that Bayrock had contemplated, from Istanbul and Kiev to Moscow and Warsaw, also never happened. We learned about the Trump uh, Tower in Fort Lauderdale when we were learning about the uh, fraud of Trump Baja in uh, Baja, California, Mexico. Remember that one from a couple months ago? Carelessness about due diligence with respect to potential partners and associates is one of Donald Trump's more predictable qualities. Maybe not the guy you want filling up federal jobs at such an amazing clip, right? Acting on the seat of the pants... He had hooked up with Bayrock rather quickly in 2005, becoming an 18% minority equity partner in the Trump Soho and agreeing to license his brand and manage the building. Exhibit A in the panoply of former Trump business partners in Bayrock's former chair is Bayrock's former chairman, Tevfik Arif. Remember, T-E-V-F-I-K, Tevfik Arif, A-R-I-F, a.k.a. Arifov, Get it? An emigre from Kazakhstan who reportedly took up residence in Brooklyn in the 1990s. Trump also had extensive contacts with another key Bayrock Russian American from Brooklyn, Felix Satter, aka Satter, S A T T E R. He added a T to his S A T E R. Maybe that's how he pronounces it, Satter. Anyway, he's discussed below. Uh, Trump has lately had some difficulty recalling very much about either Arif or Satter, but this is hardly surprising given what we now know about them. Remember, we just spent the last hour or so talking about how he didn't know Joe Chinkway either. Hmm. And Felix Satter's name should ring a bell. We definitely discussed him even more extensively than Arif at some point. Trump described his introduction to Bayrock 
in a 2013 deposition for a lawsuit that was brought by investors in the Fort Lauderdale project, one of Trump's first with Bayrock. And the quote from it, Well, we had a tenant in Trump Tower called Bayrock, and Bayrock was interested in getting us into deals. People just wanted the halls of Trump Tower. They buy office space in Trump Tower in the hopes of somehow worming their way into his office and enticing him into a stupid deal, apparently. According to several reports, Tevfik Arif was originally from Kazakhstan, a Soviet republic until 1992, Born in 1950, Arif worked for 17 years in the Soviet Ministry of Commerce and Trade, serving as Deputy Director of Hotel Management by the time of the Soviet Union's collapse. In the early 1990s, he relocated to Turkey, where he reportedly helped to develop properties for the Rixos Hotel chain, R-I-X-O-S. Not long thereafter, he relocated to Brooklyn, founded Bayrock, opened an office in the Trump Tower, and started to pursue projects with Trump and other investors. Tevfik Arif was not Bayrock's only connection to Kazakhstan. A 2007 Bayrock investor presentation refers to Alexander Mashevich's Eurasia Group as a strategic partner for Bayrock's equity finance. Together with two other prominent Kazakh billionaires, Patok Chodiev, uh, a.k.a. Shodiev, and Alijan Ibragamov. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, yes, uh, uh, Alijan uh, Ibragamov. That's my best guess on that one. Well, along with them, Mashkevich reportedly ran the Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation. In Kazakhstan, these three are sometimes referred to as the TRIO. It's certainly easier than saying all their names. The TRIO has apparently worked together ever since Gorbachev's late 1980s perestroika in metals and other natural resources. It was during this period that they first acquired a significant degree of control over Kazakhstan's vast mineral and gas reserves. Naturally, they found it useful to become friends with Nursultan Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan's longtime ruler. Indeed, the State Department cables, or some State Department cables, le- leaked by WikiLeaks, of all people, in November 2010, describe a close relationship between the trio and the seemingly perpetual Nazarbayev kleptocracy. In any case, the trio has recently attracted the attention of many other investors and news outlets, including the September 11th Commission report, interestingly, The Guardian, Forbes, and The Wall Street Journal. In addition to resource grabbing, the litany of the trio's alleged activities include money laundering, bribery, and racketeering. In 2005, according to the U.S. State Department cables released by WikiLeaks, Shodiev, referred to in State Department cables as Fatok Shodiev, was recorded on video attending the birthday of reputed Uzbek mob boss Salim Abduvalieva. Abduvalieva. Yeah, that's my... uh, it's my best. Ab, interesting. Abdu. Hmm. Salim Abdu Uluavieva. <laughs> interesting. Well, that's Uzbekistan for you. And presenting him, by the way, with a $10,000 gift or tribute. According to the Belgian newspaper Le Soir, Chodiev and Moskevich became close associates of a curious Russian Canadian businessman, Russian Canadian businessman, Boris J. Burstein who happens to have been the father-in-law of another key Russian-Canadian business associate of Donald Trump in Toronto, will return to Burstein below. The trio also turn up in the April 2016 Panama Papers database as the apparent beneficial owners of a Cook Islands company, International Financial Limited. That's real specific, isn't it? The Belgian newspapers Het La... Uh, la oh, goodness. Belgian. Het... Lots de news, I guess the latest news maybe, uh, Le Soir and La Libre Belgique have reported that Shodiev paid 23 million euros to obtain a Class B banking license for this same company, permitting it to make international currency trades. In the words of a leading Belgian financial regulator, that would, quote, make all money laundering undetectable. <clears throat> well, that's quite a magical uh, uh, license, isn't it? The Panama Papers also indicate that some of Arif's connections at the Rixos Hotel Group, 
may have ties to Kazakhstan. For example, one offshore company listed in the Panama Papers database, Group Rixos Hotel, reportedly acts as an intermediary for four BVI, British Virgin Islands, I guess, offshore companies. Rixos Hotel's CEO, Feta Taminci, T-A-M-I-N-C-E, is listed as having been a shareholder for two of these companies, while a shareholder in another, Hazara Asset Management, had the same name as the son of recent Kazakhstan Minister for Sports and Tourism. As of 2012, this Kazakh official was described as the third most influential deputy in the country's Mazhilis, the lower house of parliament, in a Forbes Kazakhstan article. According to a 2015 lawsuit against Bayrock by Jody Chris, I'm able to pronounce that name, one of its former employees, Bayrock started to receive millions of dollars in equity contributions in 2004, supposedly by way of Arif's brother in Russia, who allegedly, quote, had access to cash accounts at a chromium refinery in Kazakhstan. This as yet unproven allegation might well just be an attempt by the plaintiff to extract a more attractive settlement from Bayrock and its original principles, but it is also consistent with the fact that chromium is indeed one of Kazakh's natural resources that is reportedly controlled by the trio. As for Arif, his most recent visible brush with the law came in 2010, when he and other members of Bayrock's Eurasian trio were arrested together in Turkey during a police raid on a suspected prostitution ring, according to the Israeli daily Yediot Aronot. And we actually did make mention of this at one point, maybe some other part of it later on that comes up. We'll ring the bell. Here it comes. At the time, Turkish investigators reportedly asserted that Arif might be the head of a criminal organization that was trafficking in Russian and Ukrainian escorts, allegedly including some as young as 13. According to these assertions, big ticket clients were making their selections by way of a modeling agency, ding, a modeling agency website with Arif allegedly handling the logistics, especially going to the Turkish authorities. Now your bell will be wrong here. The preferred venue was reportedly a yacht that had once belonged to the widely revered Turkish leader Ataturk. Remember that story? I do. It was also alleged that Arif may have also provided lodging for young women at Rixos Group Hotels. They are vertically integrated, these guys, aren't they? According to Russian media, Two senior Kazakh officials were also arrested during this incident, although the Turkish foreign ministry quickly dismissed this allegation as groundless. In the end, all the charges against Arif resulting from this incident were dismissed in 2012 by Turkish courts, and his spokespeople have subsequently denied all involvement. Finally, despite Bayrock's demise and these other legal entanglements, Arif has apparently remained active. For example, Bloomberg reports... That, as of 2013, he, his son, and Rixos Hotel's CEO, Feta Taminsi, or Taminsi, had partnered to pursue the rather controversial business of advancing funds to cash-strapped, high-profile soccer players. Soccer? Again? Soccer players, yes, in exchange for a share of their future marketing revenues and team transfer fees. In the case of Arif and his partners, this new wave form of indentured servitude was reportedly implemented by way of a UK and Malta-based hedge fund, Doyen, D-O-Y-E-N, Capital, LLP. Because this practice is subject to innumerable potential abuses, including the possibility of subjecting athletes or clubs to undue pressure to sign over valuable rights and fees, UEFA, Europe's governing soccer body, wants to ban it. But FIFA... Oh my, how did they get in this story? The notorious global football regulator had been customarily slow to act. To date, Doyen Capital LLP has reportedly taken financial gambles on several well-known players, including the Brazilian star Neymar. Soccer fans will no doubt recognize that name. FIFA, Sepp Blatter, uh, certain other individuals who reside in Trump Tower. How weird. You see what I was talking about? So odd. Uh, the next section is entitled The Case of Bayrock LLC, Felix Satter. Uh, just something on him specifically. Our second exhibit is Felix Satter, the senior Bayrock executive introduced earlier. 
This is the fellow who worked at Bayrock from 2002 to 2008 and negotiated several important deals with the Trump Organization and other investors. When Trump was asked who at Bayrock had brought him uh, the Fort Lauderdale project in the 2013 deposition cited above, he replied, it could have been Felix Satter. I, it could have been. I, I really don't know who it might have been, but somebody from Bayrock. His, remember, he had the most fabulous memory of all time. Hmm. Although Satter left Bayrock in 2008, by 2010, he was reportedly back in Trump Tower, in Trump Tower, as a senior advisor to the Trump Organization, at least on his business card, with his own office in the building. And embedded in the uh, piece here is a, a, a picture of his business card, a big Trump logo, Felix H. Satter, senior advisor to Donald Trump, the Trump Organization, 725 Fifth Avenue, yada, yada, yada. Could it be just BS? Sure. Though it did say he has an email address there, fsatter at trumporg.com. So you tell me. <clears throat> uh, how easy would that be to fake? Although Satter left Bayrock in 2008, right, he's back in in 2010 inside of Trump Tower. Satter has also testified under oath that he had escorted Donald Trump Jr., and Ivanka Trump around Moscow in 2006, had met frequently with Donald over several years, and had once flown with him to Colorado. And although this might easily have been staged, <clears throat> he is also reported to have visited Trump Tower in July 2016 and made a personal contribution of $5,400 to Trump's campaign. Whatever Felix Satter has been up to recently, the key point is that by 2002, at the latest, Tevfik Arif decided to hire him as Bayrock's COO and managing director. This was despite the fact that by then, Felix had already compiled an astonishing track record as a professional criminal with multiple felony pleas and convictions, extensive connections to organized crime, and the ultimate prize, a virtual get-out-of-jail-free card based on an informant relationship with the FBI and the CIA that is vaguely reminiscent of Whitey Bulger. Satter, a Brooklyn resident like Arif, was born in Russia in 1966. He reportedly emigrated with his family to the United States in the mid-1970s and settled in Little Odessa. It seems that his father, Mikhail Shefarovsky, uh, a.k.a. Michael Satter, uh, with one T, Shefarovsky, I guess is the old, the old world uh, uh, surname, may have been engaged in Russian mob activity before he arrived in the United States. According to a certified U.S. Supreme Court petition, Felix Satter's FBI handler stated that he, quote, was well familiar with the crimes of Satter and of his father, a Semyon Mogilevich crime syndicate boss. Who knew? Hmm. A 1998 FBI report reportedly said Mogilevich's organization had approximately 250 members and was involved in trafficking nuclear materials. Hooray. Also weapons and more, as well as money laundering, and see more on that below, he says. But Michael Satter may have been less ambitious than his son. His only reported U.S. criminal conviction came in 2000, when he pled guilty to two felony counts for extorting Brooklyn restaurants, grocery stores, and clinics. He was released with three years probation. Interestingly, the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York, who handled the case at the time, Loretta Lynch, who succeeded Eric Holder as U.S. Attorney General in 2014. Back in 2000, she was also overseeing a budding informant relationship and plea bargain with Michael's son, Felix, which may help to explain the father's sentence. By then, young Felix Satter was already well on his way, to a career as a prototypical Russian-American mobster. In 1991, my favorite story, he stabbed a commodity trader in the face with a margarita glass stem in a Manhattan bar, severing a nerve. He was convicted of a felony and sent to prison. As Trump tells it, Satter simply, quote, got into a barroom fight, which a lot of people do. The sentence for this felony conviction could not have been very long because by 1993, 27-year-old Felix was already a trader in a brand new Brooklyn-based commodities firm called White Rock Partners, an innovative joint venture among four New York crime families and the Russian mob aimed at bringing state-of-the-art financial fraud to Wall Street. Hooray. And I guess the basis of that uh, Sopranos 
subplot, right? Ah, eh, anyway. Five years later in 1998, Felix Satter pled guilty to stock racketeering as one of 19 U.S. and Russian mob-connected traders who participated in a $40 million pump-and-dump securities fraud scheme. Facing 20 years in federal prison, Satter and Gennady Klotzman, a fellow Russian-American who'd been with him on the night of the Manhattan bar fight, turned snitch and helped the Department of Justice prosecute their co-conspirators. Reportedly, so did Salvatore Loria, another traitor, which he puts in scare quotes there, T-R-A-D-E-R, by the way, involved in the scheme. According to the Jody Chris lawsuit, Loria later joined Bayrock as an off-the-books paid consultant, consultant there in quotes as well. Initially, their corporation, which lasted from 1998 until at least late 2001, was kept secret cooperation. I'm sorry, not corporation. Same damn thing sometimes. Kept secret until it was inadvertently revealed in a March 2000 press release by U.S. Attorney Lynch. Unfortunately for Satter, about the same time the NYPD also reportedly discovered that he had been running a money laundering scheme and illicit gun sales out of a Manhattan storage locker. He and Klotzman fled to Russia. However, according to the New York Times, which cited Klotzman and Loria, soon after the events of September 11th, 2001, the ever-creative Satter succeeded in brokering information about the black market for Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to the CIA and FBI. According to Klotzman, this strategy bought Felix his freedom, allowing him to return to Brooklyn. It is still not clear precisely what information Satter actually provided, but in 2015, U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch publicly commended him for sharing information that she described as crucial to national security. Meanwhile, Satter's sentence for his financial crimes continued to be deferred even after his official cooperation in that case ceased in late 2001. His files remained sealed, and he managed to avoid any sentencing for those crimes at all until October 23, 2009 when he finally appeared before the Eastern District's Judge I. Leo Glasser, Felix received a $25,000 fine, no jail time, and no probation in a quiet proceeding that attracted no press attention. Some compared this sentence to Judge Glasser's earlier sentence of Mafia hitman Sammy the Bull Gravano to four and a half years for 19 murders in exchange for cooperating against John Gotti. You remember Joey No Socks's pal. In any case, between 2002 and 2008, when Felix Satter finally left Bayrock LLC and well beyond, his ability to avoid jail and conceal his criminal roots enabled him to enjoy a lucrative new career as Bayrock's chief operating officer. In that position, he was in charge of negotiating aggressive property deals all over the planet, even while, according to lawsuits by former Bayrock investors, engaging in still more financial fraud. The only apparent difference was that he changed his name from S-A-T-E-R to S-A-T-T-E-R. Big difference. In the 2013 deposition cited earlier, Trump went on to say, I don't see Felix as being a member of the mafia. Asked if he had any evidence for this claim, Trump conceded, I have none. As for Satter's pal Klotzman, the past few years have not been kind. As of December 2016, he is in a Russian penal colony working off a 10-year sentence for a failed $2.8 million Moscow diamond heist in August 2010. In 2016, Klotzman was reportedly placed on a top 10 list of Americans that the Russians were willing to exchange for high-value Russian prisoners in U.S. custody, like the infamous arms dealer Victor Bout. So far, there have been no takers, but with Donald Trump as president, who knows? Hmm. What about this one? The case of Iceland's FL Group. Were you curious about Iceland's involvement in all this? One of the most serious frauds alleged in the recent Bayrock lawsuit involves FL Group, an Icelandic private investment fund that really is a saga, haha, all its own. Iceland is not usually thought of as a major uh, offshore financial center, It is a small, snowy island in the North Atlantic, as you know, closer to Greenland than the UK or Europe, with only 330,000 citizens, and fine citizens they are, by the way, and a total GDP of just $17 billion. 20 years ago, its main experts 
exports were cod and aluminum, with the imported bauxite smelted there to take advantage of the island's low electricity cost, geothermal, by the way. But in the 1990s, Iceland's tiny neoliberal political elite had what they all told themselves was a brilliant idea. Let's privatize our state-owned banks, deregulate capital markets, and turn them loose on the world. By the time all three of the resulting privatized banks, as well as FL Group, failed in 2008, the combined bank loan portfolio amounted to more than 12 and a half times Iceland's GDP, the highest country debt ratio in the entire world. For purposes of our story, the most interesting thing about Iceland is that long before this crisis hit an utterly bankrupted FL Group, our two key Russian slash FSU slash Brooks, Brooklyn mobster mavens, Arif and Satter, had somehow stumbled on this obscure Iceland fund. Indeed, in early 2007, they persuaded FL Group to invest $50 million in a project to build the Trump Soho in midtown Manhattan. According to the Chris lawsuit, at the same time, FL Group and Bayrock's Felix Satter also agreed in principle to pursue up to an additional $2 billion in other Trump-related deals. The Chris lawsuit further alleges that FL Group, uh, abbreviated here after as FLG, also agreed to work with Bayrock to facilitate outright tax fraud on more than $250 million of potential earnings. In particular, it alleges that FLG agreed to provide the $50 million in exchange for a 62% stake in the four Bayrock Trump projects but Bayrock would structure the contract as a loan. This meant that Bayrock would not have to pay taxes on the initial proceeds, while FLG's anticipated $250 million of dividends would be channeled through a Delaware company and characterized as interest payments, allowing Bayrock to avoid up to $100 million in taxes. For tax purposes, Bayrock would pretend that their actual partner was a Delaware partnership that it had formed with FLG. That is FLG Property One LLC rather than FLG itself. You know how these things go. The Trump Organization has denied any involvement with FLG. However, as an equity partner in a Trump Soho with a significant 18% equity stake in this one deal alone, Donald Trump himself had to sign off on the Bayrock FLG deal. This raises many questions. Most of these will have to await the outcome of the Chris litigation, which might well take years, especially now that Trump is president. But several of these questions just leap off the page. First, how much did the president-elect uh, know about the partners and the inner workings of this deal? After all, he had a significant equity stake in it, unlike many of his brand name only deals. And it was also supposed to finance several of his most important East Coast properties. Second, how did the FL Group and Bayrock come together to do this dodgy deal in the first place? One former FL Group manager alleges that the deal arrived by accident. A relatively small deal was nothing special on either side. The Chris lawsuit, on the other hand, alleges that FLG was a well-known source of easy money from dodgy sources like Kazakhstan and Russia, and that other Bayrock players with criminal histories like Salvatore Loria, for example, were involved in making the introductions. At this stage, the evidence with respect to this second question is incomplete, but there are already some interesting indi uh, indications that FL Group's willingness to generously finance Bayrock's peculiar Russian-slash-FSU-slash-Brooklyn team, its rather poorly conceived Trump projects, and its purported tax dodging were not simply due to Icelandic backwardness, there is much more for us to know about Iceland's special relationship with Russian finance. In this regard, there are several puzzles to be resolved. First, it turns out that FL Group, Iceland's largest private investment fund until it crashed in 2008, had several owners and investors with deep Russian business connections, including several key investors in all three top Iceland banks. Second, it turns out that FL Group had constructed an incredible maze of cross-shareholding, lending, and cross-derivatives relationships with all these major banks, as illustrated by a snapshot that they include here in the piece of cross 
shareholding among Iceland's financial institutions and companies as of 2008. And I can tell you, when you get a chance to look at it, you'll see for yourself, it's bizarrely complex. This thicket of cross-dealing made it almost impossible to regulate control fraud where insiders at leading financial institutions went on a self-serving binge borrowing and lending to risky finance risky investments of all kinds. This would be particularly difficult in Iceland. There's only 330,000 people in the whole place. How many of them are going to be on the boards of these financial institutions? Uh, Iceland's a place that kind of has to sometimes look past, probably has to look past self-dealing issues. They just don't have a big enough pool of people. Uh, it became difficult to determine which institutions were net borrowers or investors as the concentration of ownership and self-dealing in the financial system just soared. Third, FL Group make a variety of peculiar loans to Russian-connected oligarchs as well as to Bayrock. For example, as discussed below, Alex Schneider, the Russian-Canadian billionaire who later became Donald Trump's Toronto business partner, secured a 45.8 million euro loan. Why? To buy a yacht from Kaupthing Bank during the same period, while a company belonging to another Russian billionaire who reportedly owns an important vodka franchise got an even larger loan. Fourth, Iceland's largest banks also made a series of extraordinary loans to Russian interests during the run-up to the 2008 crisis. For example, one of Russia's wealthiest oligarchs, a close friend of President Putin, nearly managed to secure at least 400 million euros, or some say up to four times that much, from Kaupthing, Iceland's largest bank, in late September 2008, just as the financial crisis was breaking wide open. This bank also had important direct and indirect investments in FL Group, Indeed, until December 2006, it is reported to have employed the FL Group private equity manager who allegedly negotiated Felix Satter's $50 million deal in early 2007. Fifth, there are unconfirmed accounts of a secret U.S. Federal Reserve report that unnamed Iceland banks were being used for, guess what, Russian money laundering. Hmm. Furthermore, Kaupthing Bank's Repeated requests to open a New York branch in 2007 and 2008 were rejected by the Fed. Similar unconfirmed rumors repeatedly appear in Danish and German publications, as did allegations about the supposed Kazakh origins of FLG's cash to be laundered in the Chris lawsuit. Sixth, there is the peculiar fact that when Iceland's banks went belly up in October 2008, their private banking subsidiaries in Luxembourg, which were managing at least 8 billion euros of private assets, were suddenly seized by Luxembourg banking authorities and transferred to a new bank, Bank Haviland. This happened so fast that Iceland's central bank was prevented from learning anything about the identities or portfolio sizes of the Iceland bank's private offshore clients. But again, there were rumors of some important Russian names. Finally, there is the rather odd phone call that Russia's ambassador to Iceland made to Iceland's prime minister at 6.45 a.m. on October 7, 2008, the day after the financial crisis hit Iceland. According to the PM's own account, the Russian ambassador informed him that then-prime minister Putin was willing to consider offering Iceland a 4 billion euro Russian bailout. Of course, this alleged Putin offer was modified not long thereafter into a willingness to entertain an Icelandic negotiating team in Moscow. By the time the Iceland team got to Moscow later that year, Russia's desire to lend had cooled, and Iceland ended up accepting a $2.1 billion IMF stabilization package instead. But according to a member of the negotiating team, the reasons for the reversal are still a mystery. Perhaps Putin had reconsidered because he simply decided that Russia had to worry about its own considerable financial problems. Or perhaps he had discovered that Iceland's banks had indeed been very generous to Russian interests on the lending side, while, given Luxembourg's actions, any Russian private wealth invested in Icelandic banks was already safe. On the other hand, there may be a simpler explanation for Iceland's peculiar generosity to sketchy partners like Bayrock, after all, right up to the last minute before the October 2008 meltdown, the whole world 
had awarded Iceland AAA ratings. Depositors queued up in London to buy open high yield uh, to open high yield Iceland bank accounts. Its bank stocks were booming, and the compensation paid to its financiers was off the charts. So why would anyone worry about making a few more dubious deals? Overall, therefore, with respect to these odd Russia-Iceland connections, the proverbial jury is still out, but all these Icelandic puzzles are intriguing and bear further investigation. I wonder how the new, more open, and more anti-banking government of Iceland might decide to proceed with any uh, future inquiries into the Russian connections there. Of course, those won't be happening under the Trump administration. There's more, much more, of course. Don't know how much more we can fit into today's show. But uh, the next section, I'll tell you, give you the headers of these next sections to give you an idea of these things. And, of course, you can read them for yourself. Next up would be the case of the Trump Toronto Tower and Hotel and Alex Schneider, who was mentioned previously. Uh, the case of Paul Manafort's Ukrainian oligarchs comes next. The case of well-connected Russia slash FSU mobsters. Uh, and let's see, what else? Uh, oh, that's a two-parter, that one. And uh, then an extensive section of notes. So not a whole lot more in here, but of course we've only got about a minute and a half to really begin wrapping things up. It's just rather amazing and uh, interesting how often... The uh, mobster connection keeps coming up. Of course, we mentioned that earlier in the week, and uh, I am a little bit concerned, although if he wants to take the risk on himself, I guess it's fine. But you do start to wonder, these private security guys, the uh, continued involvement with people like Joey No Socks, who seems relatively harmless compared to these other guys, but what do I know? Maybe it's just a facade he puts up. You do start to wonder about whether or not he's a player in his own right or is he a hostage of international mobsters. You don't want the president to be hostage to international mobsters. Uh, I would find it disconcerting. I think you probably would, too. Uh, let's see. I guess there's probably not that much more that we can sneak in here, but there are a couple other mentions in this next section both of Alex Schneider and, remember, Boris Burstein also. Uh, he makes an appearance in this next section. It really is a fascinating web that has been woven. Uh, I know the point of the piece is to assert that Donald Trump is seated at the center of this whole mess, although that's really very difficult to believe in uh, in the strictest sense. To me, I think it is far more likely, I think, that uh, he's been seated at the uh, at the periphery of all of this and is a bit player in what's going on. Uh, an important one, and now more important than ever, but uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it even begins to answer the question of why did, given all the objections of important personages like, say, Howard Stern, why did uh, Donald Trump decide to essentially ruin his life by running for the presidency. I mean, it's a, it's a, it seems like a fine thing to put uh, in your cap as a feather, but was Donald Trump really cut out for this job? He's got, obviously no one thinks he was. And sure, any challenge that's laid before him that he thinks he can accomplish, he's going to probably try to take on. But, uh, hmm, I don't know. It makes you wonder whether there were outside forces driving him to do it. And, of course, he might have agreed to do it more readily if, for instance, they were to give him some inkling of the kind of support they might be able to afford him in the campaign. Of course, we'll likely never know what the incoming president knew and when he knew it, as ominous as that question is. Uh, he is not inclined to answer any questions, and there's virtually no one in the world that can force him to do so. But hey, good luck with your efforts. It's a hell of a way to close out a Friday, but at least I was able to share these things with you. I want them on your radar. You'll want them there, too, as depressing as they are. Stay tuned, though, for the guys picking up the mic at the after show next. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The K-Girl in the Morning Show.
with David Waltman. Thank you very much for listening. Do stay tuned for the after show. And don't forget to turn on C-SPAN to see the action inside the House chamber, the joint session of Congress, and the calculation of the electoral vote. Let's see if there's going to be any fireworks. It sounds like there might even be some takers to raise some connections. Stay tuned.